to the series. Before adding the logic of rock, paper, scissors to our application, let's consider the components of the game. We'll need to represent each of these components in our application in some way using code to create the rock, paper, scissors game. One part is the players. We're already representing the players as participants, Alice and Bob. We'll also need to represent the different hands of the game, rock, paper, and scissors. A simple way to represent them is as numbers, 0, 1, and 2. There are also three outcomes for the game. Bob wins, there's a draw, or Alice wins. We'll use a similar strategy to represent these outcomes as 0, 1, and 2. The first step we'll take in adding this logic to our reach code is to specify how Bob and Alice will interact between the front end and the back end. Specifically, we need to add the code that lets Alice and Bob make a move, either rock, paper, or scissors. We'll also need to add code that informs Alice and Bob of the outcome, who won the game. To start, we'll define a participant interact interface that both players will use. We'll call it player. This interact interface will contain two behaviors, get hand and get outcome. These are the two behaviors that we want both players to have. We want to be able to get the hand of the player and we want each player to be able to see the outcome of the game. In programming, we refer to these behaviors as methods or functions. That's what fun stands for, function. The get hand method takes in no inputs and it outputs a number. This number represents the hand, either rock, paper, or scissors. That's why we see the empty square brackets and the uint in parentheses. It's defining the input and the output of the function. For the second function, the input is a number. This number represents the outcome of the game, whether Bob wins, it's a tie, or Alice wins. The output is null. This is another way to say the output is nothing. Let's add this interface to our participants so Alice and Bob can use them. We'll take away our comments and add the player interface. Perfect. The get hand and see outcome functions will be implemented on the front end. The front end will decide how the hand is chosen between rock, paper, and scissors. It will also decide what happens when the outcome of the game is revealed. We define them here so that the back end knows how to communicate with the front end. It knows an implementation of get hand exists, but it doesn't know exactly how it works. It just knows it can retrieve the hand. Same thing with see outcome. It can communicate that the outcome of the game has occurred and send it off to the front end. Then the front end decides how to handle that result. Before we move any further here, let's implement these functions on the front end. To start off, we'll define the various hands a player can have as well as the different outcomes. We'll do this with something called an array. An array is a data structure that can hold a series of elements. We can retrieve each of these elements using an index starting at zero. This means to retrieve rock from the hand variable, we would use the index zero. To retrieve scissors, we'd use the index two. Next, we'll implement the idea of a player. Previously, we just defined what operations a player can have, get hand and see outcome. On the front end, we'll add some logic so that a player can actually play the game. To do this, we'll create a constructor. This constructor will take in the player's name as input. Now, a constructor is a special type of function that creates an object. We can use the object to perform special operations in code. It's a tool for organization as well as code reuse. We'll want Alice and Bob to have access to the same set of functionality. Using a constructor to create a player object for Alice and a player object for Bob allows us to do this. Now what will this player object contain? Well, the two behaviors we want the player to have are get hand and see outcome. Let's add them in. These look pretty similar to what we created in the back end, but the difference is that now we'll add an implementation. We'll write the code that tells the machine what to do when these behaviors occur. 
In the back end, we're just saying that these behaviors exist. But it's up to the front end to actually implement these behaviors. For the get hand function or the get hand behavior, we'll want to pick rock, paper, scissors at random. Eventually, we'll get to the point where you can ask the user for input. But for now, the choice will be random. If we look at the data we created with hand, we have an array of possible hands, rock, paper, scissors. We also know we can access each of these using an index, 0, 1, or 2. This means we can randomly generate an index and then use that index to retrieve the hand. To randomly generate an index, we'll use some built-in functions. We'll use math.random to generate a random number and then we'll multiply it by 3. This will give us a number between 0 and 3. Then we'll use math.floor to round it down to a whole number, so either 0, 1, or 2. Finally, we'll save it in a constant called hand. After calculating this, we'll display it to the console so that the user knows what hand was chosen. We can do this with a log statement in JavaScript. To access the value of the who input, we can use the dollar sign with curly braces. It's important to note that this backtick mark is not just a quote. It's a backtick that's usually near the escape key on your keyboard. Now to show what hand was played, we'll access the hand array with dollar sign hand, and then use our index hand to access rock, paper, or scissors. At the end, we'll return the hand from the function, the index hand, so either 0, 1, or 2. We send it off to the back end. For the second function, all we want to do is display the outcome to the user. This function has an input called outcome, and this is a number that represents the outcome of the game. We can use this as an index to access the value in our outcome array. We'll retrieve the text value that matches with this number. Let's create the log statement. Console.log with the back ticks. We'll access the who value again and say saw outcome, and then retrieve the outcome from our outcome array using that outcome index. Perfect. Now we can apply these to Alice and Bob. These player objects will be bound to the interact and reach. We'll talk more about the interact later on, but the key component here is that the front end doesn't include many details about the consensus network or the decentralized application. They're abstracted to the back end, so you can focus on the business logic here. Now let's go to the back end, our code in reach. In a real life game of rock, paper, scissors, Alice and Bob simultaneously decide what hand will play and they reveal it at the same time. This is a complex concept that's pretty difficult to realize in practice. For example, if you've ever played against a little kid, you may notice them trying to see what you're going to choose and delaying till the last minute to show you their hand so they'll win. In a decentralized application, it's not possible to have simultaneousness. Instead, we'll select a participant to go first. In this case, we'll choose Alice. Now the game will proceed in three steps. First, the back end for Alice will interact with its front end, get Alice's hand, and publish it to the network. To interact with Alice's front end, we'll access Alice and use only. Only Alice will do the following actions. In this case, that's retrieve Alice's hand. We can use the interact object to interact with the front end and get Alice's hand. Then we'll declassify it. In reach, all the information from the front end is secret until it's explicitly made public with declassify. Now let's save this in a variable called hand Alice. At this point, only Alice knows Alice's hand. To publish it to the network, we can use alice.publish and we'll publish Alice's hand. The reason we publish it to the network is so that the consensus network can evaluate the outcome of the game. Anytime we publish to the network, the code goes into a consensus step where all participants act together. 
will need to commit this to the network in order to return to a local step where individual participants can act alone. The next step is to retrieve Bob's hand. We'll use Bob.only because only Bob will do this step, retrieve Bob's hand. It'll look pretty similar to the Hand Alice implementation, except this time it's Bob's hand. We'll also publish Bob's hand. Now instead of committing Bob's hand to the network, we'll compute the outcome of the game. To compute this outcome, we'll be using some nifty arithmetic logic. We won't dive too much into it now, but the modulo operator, or this percent sign, takes the remainder of the equation in the parentheses divided by 3. This means if Alice's hand is rock, or 0, and Bob's hand is 2, or scissors, the equation becomes 0 plus 4 minus 2, 4 minus 2 is 2, 0 plus 2 is also 2, so 2 modulo 3 also becomes 2, because 2 divided by 3 has the remainder 2. Now if we use this remainder as the index for the outcome array, jumping over to the front end, we see that it maps up to Alice wins. And this is what we expect, because Alice played rock and Bob played scissors. Now all we have to do is communicate this outcome to the front ends. We'll use the each keyword so we can do the following for both Alice and Bob. For each of these participants, we'll use the interact object to interact with the front end. We'll want to use the see outcome operation or the see outcome function. The outcome we want them to see is this outcome, the one we saved in the constant. So we'll pass that through as well. Now that's our program. Let's run it. Here we see the Docker container getting built, and Alice played rock, Bob played rock, and it's a draw. They both played the same thing. Since the players act randomly, if I run it again, I should get a different output. Let's run it. This time they both played paper. Let's do it again. Someone has to win at some point. All right, Alice played paper and Bob played rock. This means Alice wins, paper beats rock. If you got any errors running this, be sure to check out the Reach Discord and the Days of Blockchain channel. Now with our front end, we act as both participants. We act as Alice and as Bob, which is why we see both players represented in our console. We see what each player played and the outcomes. Consensus networks in general, and REACH specifically, guarantee that all participants agree on the outcome of their decentralized application. This is where the name Consensus Network comes from. They enable these distributed, untrusted parties to come to a consensus or agreement about the intermediate states of a computation. If they all agree on these intermediate states, then they must also agree on the output. That's why every time you watch Reach Run, Bob and Alice agree on the same outcome. Thank you again to Algorand and Reach for sponsoring the series. If you have any questions about blockchain development, please join me in the Reach Discord in the Days of Blockchain channel. In the next lesson, we'll add some stakes to the game to make it more interesting. See you next time and happy coding.